uh, as well as nuclear, I can promise that. And then I'll go to a favorite topic. Uh, I think we all like our cars, or many people like cars, so, uh, and how that fits in the energy system of the future. And then lastly, um, <coughs> a focus on, on the United Arab Emirates. It's, that's actually a country where uh, I live and work, and we're trying to build relationships uh, in the field of clean energy between the, the Gulf states uh, and Europe. Now, that is um, the network that uh, I, I work with. So basically, it's a political institution. We've got two parents. We have the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, and the European Union, uh, and, and they both basically tell us what we, what we should do, uh, but they also support, of course, our activities. Um, we're organized around six main topics. We work on renewable energy, we work on energy efficiency, demand side management, the integration of electricity grids, we work on clean fossil fuels, we work on carbon capture and storage, and finally, climate change. And uh, we've been operational since 2010. The, the salaries and some of the activities are paid for by the European Commission. Uh, but we're, we're getting enough support also from the Gulf uh, countries where we do most of our activities. Um, we have three main functions and we're organized around those, so we're a bridge between the two regions. Uh, we're a platform, uh, we provide a platform for people, for people to come and debate uh, and exchange information and experience. And we're a source of information, we've got a great uh, uh, website that, that provides that. Now, um, let's look at some of the trends and the issues. And, um, basically, I mean, this is probably what you've all seen before. Yesterday, we, we were with Maros uh, Sefcovic, uh, the Vice President of the European Commission in charge of energy. He was talking about these four Ds. Um, he was with Isabelle Cochet, the CEO of Angie, who was talking about a 3D world, which basically covered uh, the same D. So it's, it's, maybe you cannot really see it's decarbonization, of course, it's, it's digitization or digitalization, you have decentralization and democratization. So the 3Ds of Angie, although they include also democratization, um, this is certainly something that, that you've all seen. So I, I don't think I need to go into each and every one to, under, to, to make you understand what you, what you already understand. But the, the unifying factors between those is that they all start with a D uh, and they end with, a, with Ization. And I was one of the early adopters of, of democratization. I think it was 2010. And somehow these things, when you use them a lot in, uh, in speeches, they, they have a tendency of wearing off. So for a while, I've been thinking about the next D word. Uh, and I think today um, we can launch the new D word, which is D-based loadization. And it's, it's actually uh, uh, something that builds upon uh, some of the debate that we've seen before. And uh, maybe I'll take you to uh, two slides that actually explain how we've organized our electricity system. Now, this is the traditional way. This is a typical, uh, I would say, European daily load. Uh, so you have, you know, at night people sleep, the factories are not working, but there's still always base load. So that is something that you always have. Then you start ramping up, you wake up, you start working. Uh, of course, the demand uh, increases. So typically, the, the base load is covered um, you know, in, in Europe and many other places with nuclear uh, and coal, typically pulverized coal power plants. Then you have the intermediate peakers, which is typically combined cycle gas. Uh, it's a little bit more, more expensive to build and, and to run, uh, but they don't need uh, the hours uh, of the base load. And then you have a few hours where you need peak. And, and you do that with a very inexpensive gas peaker. They're not very efficient. Main cost is fuel, but you don't only run them for a few hours. Um, and, and then that works from a business uh, perspective. Now, if we're looking at, and this is dollars per MMBTU, um, these are the, the, the prices of the last 70 years or so of, of the main fuels, the main fossil fuels. And, it, and I mean, of course, it goes up and uh, a little bit and down a little bit, depending on whether you're in a crisis or, uh, or not. Um, and, and, and basically what happened is then, then solar came. And I've been in the Middle East for, for eight years now, five years ago, solar electricity was, with a large margin, the most expensive cost of electricity. And right now, it's by some margin the cheapest form of electricity. So th that is what has happened in the last five years. And basically, the challenge is to accommodate this because it, it happens so fast. I think this is, this is basically you know, part of the challenge. And, and this is the new structure. 
and, and because we, we have now, because it's cheap, a lot of solar panels and wind turbines, and it doesn't matter how we finance them, whether it was a feed-in tariff or whether it was um, you know, a tax rebate or whatever, an auction, once you have them, the marginal costs are nearly zero. We've heard that before, you know, O&M costs are, are close to zero. So that is what you take first. It's called the merit order. If you have something that has fuel costs, you have something that doesn't have fuel costs, this is what you take. That's just plain economics. So that is your new base load. And then the rest, the rest of the daily demand peak has to, has to be accommodated to basically match that. And this is, I think, where some of the struggle is because, of course, we have a lot of coal-fired power plants, some nuclear power plants, and the stuff that, that was basically designed and built to run uh, all the time, and that is being pushed out now more and more, and I mean, we're in Europe, there's plenty of countries where we have that, where the economic model is basically challenged right now. So this is, you know, de base loadization. Now, um, the future is flexible, I don't think, uh, we need to go through this because I'm sure you've seen that uh, many times before. These are the, the, basically the four types of flexibility that we have to ha have. It can be either in integration, uh, better integration with grids, demand response, dispatchable renewables, um, and uh, of course storage. And hydrogen is one of those things. Now, let me look at something that many people like, cars. This is a, uh, a wood gasifier, it was in, in the times when you know, there was no fuel, so you could actually rebuild your car to, to run it on, uh, um, uh, on, on, on wood. Now, if we're looking at, at the car in the last 100 years, it's still a square box, it has roughly four, four seats, it's got a steering wheel, um, uh, an internal combustion engine, and if you look at 100 years of, the, of development, then is the, the, the progress, sorry, the progress in, in the technology is actually pretty, pretty poor. You mean this, you know, they're a little bit more, you know, more convenient, uh, they, they, they go faster, and, but the fuel economy hasn't really dramatically improved. So it, it's still roughly the same, maybe a factor two better, which is, which is really nothing in a hundred year of innovation. Now, if we're then looking at the overall energy picture, if you're looking at the energy content that, it, that is in oil when, when you haven't pumped it up, and then you take the entire chain of, of pumping it up, of refining, transporting, then converting that in your internal combustion engine, and then basically use that for what you need it, which is to transport a, a piece of person from A to B, then the overall efficiency is a, it's around 1%. So 99% were wasting. And that wasting, you know, in the car itself, it's, it's mostly heat. So your, your car is, is in effect, it, it's, a, it's a moving stove with, with a heavy emphasis uh, on the stove uh, bit. Now, um, the other thing with cars is we're not using cars. On average, you use 20,000 kilometers per year, which is, which is one hour per day. So 23 hours per day your car is sitting there doing nothing. I mean, none of you is driving right now, and I'm sure many people have cars. So it's not only extremely inefficient, but it's also very, it's what you call a stranded asset. Now, what can you do better? In, the, in terms of efficiency, electric vehicles are already a lot better than, <clears throat> than internal combustion engines. Of course, it depends on where you get your electricity from. We heard that, but it's already a one step up. But we still have, you know, some limitations with the range uh, as well as how long it takes uh, to, to, to basically charge that battery. So another technology is the fuel cell vehicle, and it's, it's, it's basically the same. The only difference is that you have your, your, um, uh, your electric um, power plant on board. You know, it runs on hydrogen, it produces electricity and water, uh, and, it, and it's, it's, it's in effect an electric vehicle without the disadvantages. Your range is the same as your fuel or, or your, your, your gas-fired power, um, as your, your petrol car, uh, and you can basically uh, fill your car within three minutes, uh, the same as you would do now. Now let's look at the overall number of cars. We have um, about, uh, we're, we're building new cars, about 80 million every year. Now if every, 
car that we built new would be uh, a fuel cell vehicle, and it would have a 100 kilowatt fuel cell on board, which is a power plant. You know, we're actually building every year 80,000 gigawatts of electric generation capacity. Now, the overall installed capacity of all power plants on the world is 50,000 gigawatts. So every year, if we would build fuel cell vehicles, we would build more capacity than we have already within a year. So, and I think this is, this is an interesting uh, thought experiment because we're, first of all, we're not using the car very much to drive one hour a day. So 23 hours a day, we would have, if we would have fuel cell vehicles, we would have all the capacity to generate electricity um, that we need. And we would not necessarily need a whole bunch of traditional power plants other than, of course, to, gen to, to produce the hydrogen. So that's the, that's the thought. And of course, it's not mine. Uh, it's my old boss, Professor Van Wijk from Delft University, who came up with this idea. And we did an experiment, and we, we looked at what that would mean for the country I live in, the United Arab Emirates. Now, we have um, a, a low-cost energy producer. You know, it's, it's cheap to, to pump the oil up. But it's also, uh, as you may have seen, uh, the, the, the present world record holder in terms of low, lowest cost electricity from solar. Uh, Abu Dhabi had a recent auction, and it was 2.42 dollar cents per kilowatt hours. Uh, uh, Dubai, it's 2.99. They're roughly in the same ballpark because the, the metrics are slightly different in the two. But so it, it's less than three dollar cents per kilowatt hours. So really cheap. Now, let's assume that you know, all those cars that we have, and there's about 5 million cars, let's assume that we would all um, you know, convert them to fuel cell vehicles. Um, these 5 million cars, they drive about 100 billion kilometers per year, which would require 1 billion kilo of hydrogen uh, per year. Now, we can produce that using sunshine and water. That would be the pitch where the European technology comes in, and this is what we're trying to do. Uh, we would need 141 gigawatts of solar PV. Electrolyzers, land use is actually less than 4%. So it's not something that's impossible to conceive. Uh, and if we do this kind of stuff at the scale that we would need to do it, you know, I think we can look at costs of, of $2 per kilo of hydrogen, two to three. I mean, these are numbers that are, are you know, possible and feasible. Now. Let's then assume the system where we have about 30% solar PV going directly into the grid. I mean, it's during the daytime. That's when you need most electricity anyway. And then the rest uh, goes towards producing the hydrogen. And you use those cars to, to basically fill the gaps. Uh, the thing is, self-driving cars, again, it's not science fiction. It, it, it's going to be here in a couple of years. So basically, your car takes you to wherever you need to go during the day. It, it drops off the kids at school, takes you to the office, and then it, it drives off, and it goes to a parking system where you hook up with hydrogen, produces electricity. At night, you can do that. And all of that, you know, it's not science fiction. It's, it's technology that we have today. And then you connect it to the grid. And you would produce 100 terawatt hours per year, which is basically what we have right now. We would also produce as a byproduct 5% of the drinking water in the country. And as you may know, in the Gulf, most of the drinking water is actually desalinated water. So this is a nice benefit. So we can shut down the conventional power plants. It's one upside. Um, in terms of money, the driving, I mean, if we have, if we, if we can make hydrogen at $2 per kilo, the driving would be 50% cheaper. So it's an immediate saving. If, if you do millions and millions of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, they don't need to be more expensive than an internal combustion uh, engine. The cost of electricity in this mix, 30% PV directly, the rest hydrogen, and you use your cars, uh, would be around 7 cents per kilowatt hours. And that is the same in the mix that we have right now. But the, the mix will include, in the future, nuclear, which is more expensive than the seven. And it will include probably higher cost for the gas. So I think in, in terms of where is this going, probably it, it, it looks like an interesting proposition, something that will improve over time. And again, uh, we uh, at the network are trying to 
you know, now organize a pilot. There's an Expo 2020 in Dubai coming, a World Expo, and we're trying to actually start, uh, you know, some activities that will lead in the end to this. And, and as, as Hor also uh, said, uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that you can do is actually do chemistry. Uh, you can do uh, larger transport. You can run a train on hydrogen. You can run trucks on hydrogen. All of that is not yet possible with batteries. So in that sense, I think it's a, it's, it's a lot more interesting uh, and, and a lot more challenging uh, for the region uh, than um, you know, the present solutions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Frank, for your insights. Does anyone have a quick question for Frank, who's come in from overseas for this special occasion? Anybody in the back? In that case, I, I invite you to read up more on the hydrogen power using clean cars as power plants that was written by Frank and his colleague. And uh, that's my last pitch for Revolve Magazine tonight. Now I'm going to pass the floor over to my colleague and friend, Diedrich Peterbaum, who's senior director at Burson Mosteller, who's going to introduce and moderate the second panel that is about the, the innovations coming to market. So the floor is yours, and the panelists, please come up. Good afternoon, still good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to be a bit challenged here um, because it's a hot day. It's th the last part of the day. And uh, there's a gentleman who holds the key to the bar who has not yet, had, has not yet arrived, uh, but he will, I'm being told. So um, this session is really, in a way, kind of for you to earn your, uh, your drinks. Um, but we're going to make that wait uh, as pleasant as possible with a, a very good uh, panel to discuss um, the innovations. So a little bit more talking about the how that uh, was already referred to in the, in the previous panel. Um, before we do that, and before I introduce the panel, I'd like to, you to kind of move a little bit because I think you've been sitting still uh, all the time. And I'm abusing my... Uh, my privilege as the, the moderator to ask a question which uh, I've been wanting to ask. So we're in, in EU Sustainable Energy Week, an annual event, and so we have a very much an interested and expert audience. And my question is, when we're talking about technologies and opportunities, how many of the people in the room have switched electricity producer or energy producer in the past year since... Uh, last uh, EU Sustainable Energy Week. I see the heat pump uh, people do their, do their job. So there's a few people showing their hands, but it's a, it's a minority of this very unrepresentative sample, of course. Maybe another one. Who of you has bought, since last year, an electric vehicle? I've given one back to the leasing company. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Also, just a, a handful at best uh, on these. Um, and maybe, maybe a final, final one, uh, also linking to, to our, our first speaker. Who has experienced or uh, been engaged in demand response um, activities uh, for his personal energy use? I guess there's not many Italians here. That's okay. it. That's it. So, all right. Well, thanks, thanks for that. Um, gives a good example. Hopefully, next year, we'll have an opportunity to ask the same questions again, and then uh, there'll be more hands, uh, hands going up. Um, that's as much talking as I probably want to do um, for this session. Um, as I said, the objective of this session that I've discussed with the panelists before is really to try and, and talk about kind of the, the technologies, the innovations that need to, uh, need to happen. Um, and so the question is, what are those innovations, those technologies? Uh, what needs to happen? What actions need to be taken? And who needs to take those actions? I think those are, for me, three crucial questions that need to be answered. And I hope, and I'm quite confident that we have at least some answers or beginning of answers with an, an expert uh, uh, panel here um, sitting beside me. 
Um, what we're going to do is we're going to get, like in the first panel discussion, um, a few brief introductions from the panelists. Um, we'll start with uh, Nicola from Enel, um, followed by Constantine uh, talking about the, the networks and technologies uh, development. Uh, and then finally, uh, the third speaker will be Diego uh, to, uh, to close that off. And after that, we'll, um, we'll try to dig a deep, bit deeper in some of those questions. Having said that, I'm not going to be the one who stands between you and your cocktail. Uh, which by then you'll have, have, uh, have deserved. But uh, without further ado, I would like to, uh, to hand the floor to, to Nicola to, uh, to get us uh, up to speed. Thank you, Diederik. And uh, so talking about innovation, and uh, I'm very happy after uh, the previous panel and the Frank uh, speech, uh, because uh, the, the, this starts from where they left. No? And the question is, uh, Recognize that we are really living a paradigm shift, so everything is changing in the energy market. We heard about uh, a new base load, which is flexible, coming from renewables. We heard about electric vehicles, hydrogen, uh, demand response, etc. So supply is changing, demand is changing all the time. Uh, it's difficult to bet on one run of technology. Uh, it's all very dynamic at the moment. Uh, so how do we innovate and we make sure that the system we create uh, keeps uh, being uh, uh, the most competitive system, allow us to decarbonize, allow us to have a fair deal to the consumers, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't have an answer to those, all those questions, but I can share the experience we had as a utility uh, on how we changed our business model and we really built a system which is now part of uh, what we do every day uh, on how to integrate innovation and sustainability in our company. So it all started with uh, the concept. So innovation, as we've seen, is not really an option right now. It's a way of survival in a world that is changing very quickly. We believe that companies that will be able to innovate and move very quickly and being very flexible will survive. And other companies which are very rigid and will stick to one or another business model, either they will be incredibly lucky and get it right the first time, or they will die and lose competitiveness. So how we can, we can make sure that we keep this flexibility and speed? Well, by doing several things. The first one is uh, to embed uh, in our business model really the value of innovation and sustainability. So the two concepts for us are the same, uh, two, two faces of the same medal. So, so you cannot do innovation without sustainability today, and you cannot do with sustainability without innovation. So the first thing we did uh, is uh, to commit to the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, on the areas in which we, as a utility, can make a difference. So we picked four and we set hard targets, including a full decarbonization by 2050 and the line that we are following. So as a utility, we are decarbonizing little by little. Each year we measure our advancement. The same we do for job creation, the same we do for electrification, and the same we do for education. Uh, and we measure all our projects across those dimensions in addition to you know, the normal uh, uh, hardware rates, MPV, et cetera, that we use for the financial modeling. So this is first. So innovation sustainability at the same level as uh, profitability. And it's not one or the other, because it doesn't work that way anymore. It's one and the other, or you will face risk that you will not understand, and on one or another project, you will just crash. Then we changed our structure, our organization. So innovating from the center was very difficult, because then when we went to the field, it was like you know, the hard test and the central ideas didn't work. But it's very difficult to innovate from the field because when you do that, every time you need to start over. So you lose the global scale. So we really created a system in which uh, the countries, so the people who are on the field, uh, innovate in terms of being uh, near their customers, their consumers, their regulators. There are very specific opportunities that they have. And they are the one in charge of our projects, either on the sustainability side or technology side. Then from a central level, we take all the experiences that we have around the world and we talk with other sectors, other companies in the same sector, regulators, the best in class, universities, et cetera, to understand where the technology innovation is going. So we make sure that we are top on solar. We are top in the world on wind. We are top in the world on other technologies. And then these two guys start talking to each other. So this guy has the idea, the other guys have to implement those ideas at a local scale. Global partnership, local partnership. Then you have a third dimension, which is not the technological dimension, it's not the local dimension, but it's the dimension of uh, 
of, uh, I don't have the line there, of the process. So you need a central unit which really understand how not just the technologies move, but how they play with each other, how the system is working. What is the new role for flexible capacity? What is the new role of solar? Do we need to have batteries at the level of each home so that you have the power wall there? Do we need to have batteries at the level of distribution? Do we need to have batteries at the level of transmission? Do we need to have batteries in each wind turbine? We don't know yet. So you need people who have a view on the entire system and play with different technologies in different parts of the value chain to see what works. And what works in China may be different from what works in India and may be different from what works in Mexico. But all these dimensions need to speak to each other. Otherwise, you will lose opportunities. Fourth, no, third, not only innovation comes from the inside. Actually, we don't do research and development anymore. What we do, we created an open system. So we talk to people. And we realize that most of the innovation doesn't come from within the company, it comes from the outside, our partners. And we do that in a very open way. So we create a website for startups. Actually, startups can subscribe to the website. They enter a funnel in which uh, they are part of the selection committee internally. We talk to them, we understand their idea, we finance them sometimes. But most of all, it's not really financing, is we buy their products. We know what their value creation is, we accelerate the time to market, and then we integrate them in our business models. And then we also use crowdsourcing, which is not crowdfunding. But here we put on the web a problem we want to solve. Uh, we have some on drones, uh, the icing for uh, the lines, uh, PV cleaning. Uh, we have some on uh, uh, failure prediction in transmission line that uh, go deep into a forest or are very difficult to monitor, etc. So we ask the net. So who can understand this problem and find out a solution that help us solve a specific problem? And we discovered that on the nine problem we post, on the seven, say eight problem we posted online, seven were solved by people. And some of these people work for our company. And we're able to pass that idea through the ERC, but they were able to pass that idea through a website. So, so, so it, was, <laughs> it was very funny. Uh, another example uh, of partnership. A, a mistake uh, I think we made as a, as a sector in the past was to be too self-focused. And now we discovered that most of the ideas and the value creation comes from the boundary. So working together, transport sector, electricity sector, manufacturing sector, other sector, we discovered, for example, that we can provide solution to take away pollution in city. So that's not an electricity service. That's a social service, basically. But cities ask us, how can you help us to really to take out this very big problem that they have? I come from Mexico City. It was a disaster there. It's a weird days in which we couldn't circulate with cars. So having electric cars is not really about the cost of the electric car. It's about being able to send your kids to school. So what's the value of that? It's, it's, it's huge. And talking about uh, uh, the electric vehicles, so it's, uh, it was mentioned that uh, cars stay parked 96% of the time. So here we are experimenting with that. For example, this is an example, uh, uh, a project we have in Denmark and we are replicating in the UK. So electric vehicle for us is a battery, a battery for us is a power plant. So we are aggregating power plants. And nowadays we are aggregating vehicles to use those cars when they are parked. 96% of the time, as virtual power plants, and we provide primary frequency reserve to the grid. And you know what? This covers much more than the difference of cost you have between a traditional vehicle and an electric vehicle today. So starting in 2021, 2022, uh, depending on uh, when you believe you will reach grid parity, electric vehicle actually will be able to get you money from the grid and from the services you are providing. So these are, are just some provocations, let's say, for, to, to, for the panel. And then I hope you will take it from here and, uh, and we'll have a meaningful conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic uh, insight into how a utility has, uh, has moved on and is innovating. Um, and I'm sure there will be some reactions. Uh, and hopefully you'll have some time for questions as well. Um, I'd like to kind of use that as a, as a step up to, um, to the presentation by, uh, by Konstantin Stachus, uh, chairman of the European Technology and Innovation Platform, Smart Networks for Energy Transition. It's a mouthful, a um, <laughs> but uh, he also has a lot to, uh, lot to cover. So the floor is yours, Konstantin. The beginning, I can go relatively quickly. Uh, you've talked already about a paradigm shift. Uh, I, I see it the same way. We base our 
research and innovation prioritization um, on that idea that the interplay between the climate protection and renewables paradigm shift and the digitalization and the markets introduction that goes along with that, certainly in Europe, but also in other parts of the world. That's a, a big thing in Europe. It's a big thing worldwide for uh, the energy supply, and it requires a lot of research and innovation. Um, this ETIP snet mouthful that you <laughs> referred to <laughs> um, came out of what was a bit uh, less aggregated before as a research and prioritization structure for uh, smart grids, which then added storage aspects. And uh, just a year ago, we basically then founded the, this ETIP snet smart networks, not just grids, for the energy transition to make sure the goal of energy transition and decarbonization is, is clear and guides us all, and that we're talking about sector coupling, meaning the interface to the other kinds of networks related to mobility, to heating, to the cities, the urban energy, and so on. Um, so it's beyond just the smart electricity grids. Um, it looks at the electricity network as the backbone of it all where um, the fluctuations of renewables that we've seen talked about before uh, basically require there's a whole bunch of flexibility in the entire system. Some of it can come from the network itself. Some of it comes from the demands. Of course, certain kinds of generation are very flexible and need to become more flexible. Storage can play a major role, as, as you've just said and other speakers today have said. And then the interactions with the other energy networks become a real interesting question that I want to focus on as one example of what we're trying to prioritize. Because when we're talking about all this wonderful electricity grid, which we've been liberalizing for years, where Europe is world leader in a systematic approach uh, to a market in electricity that empowers the customer more and more, that's all fine. We have a wholesale market that gives a different price in a different country for every hour, and we can envision, I think, a retail market that gives a different price to every customer on each low voltage feeder for every five minutes sometimes in the future. Maybe that price comes through redispatch signals, maybe it comes through something else. But that's fairly easy for us who work in electricity to envisage. Where is that sort of price disaggregation on the other networks? Some of you might argue, well, we don't need it. Uh, you know, the gas has storage of energy in it. Uh, the hydrogen has storage of energy in it. Well, that can perhaps, for the electricity system, then provide some flexibility that we urgently need in electricity. But how are we going to really integrate that in the market if the price differentiation isn't there? That, I think, is one of our biggest challenges we have. And then, of course, information and communication technologies need to be at the center. The question for the panel was, where does the research money come from? Where does the innovation money come from, pushing it into the market? Well, obviously, especially if you're talking about innovation and pushing things into the market, the private funding needs to be the majority and is more and more the majority. And then the rest of it uh, needs to be coordinated with that somehow uh, in order to get the biggest effect. Just a really short glimpse at how we're prioritizing the research for this energy transition, looking at all the sector couplings with the electricity networks and systems and markets at the center. And I already emphasized the word flexibility. We've been talking about flexibility here in many of the presentations today. And you can see on the right hand side there that for one of the big pillars of our research prioritization related to this distribution level, we think, of course, the flexibility can and should come from renewables, from storage, from transport, from interactions with other networks, and of course, also some from the thermal power generation. You've seen lists like that before. But one of the big challenges we have is now, how does that really work in the market framework? In the discussion we had just an hour ago, the people who were sitting here were arguing very well about, well, how much hydrogen, hydrogen should there be? How much gas should there be? How much nuclear should there be? How much renewables? And the answer that the European Union would love to give above all for the last 20 years is, well, let the market decide. 
We don't know yet how this really is going to work with the hydrogen network. We don't know where and which countries it's going to work well. We don't know which country is going to support nuclear in principle or not. But the cost of it is certainly going to be a big factor. So the European Union's favorite answer would be if we could only get the CO2 price right. You know, let the market decide. But since so much of this market action is actually happening right at the prosumer, the PV on the rooftops, the small wind park in the region, the battery in the home, the electric car battery that, that has been discussed here. These are not central decisions. These are very, very disaggregated decisions. So if we want to let the market decide, we got to have not only the fantastic wholesale electricity market we have today, we got to have a fantastically integrated wholesale and retail electricity market with functioning market interfaces to the other forms of energy, combined heat and power, gas networks, hydrogen, and whatever. And then the investment decisions for how much hydrogen, how much nuclear, how much distributed batteries and whatever can hopefully come from market-based decisions by each prosumer taking those signals and making the best of it. So that, for me, is one example out of 38, I think, was the last count uh, research priority topics that we're uh, defining for the next three years in our latest implementation plan, which will go public in eight days. Um, this is just one example out of those 38, and out of that one example, just a subset, but imagine distributed energy resources, demand response, distributed storage. These right market price signals will be crucial. They'll guide investment too, and you can easily translate that into the concept of sharing economy, zero marginal cost economy, interrupted by price spikes during the Dunkelflaute in the winter. Um, the basic concept is with more electric vehicles, with heat pumps, there will be more distribution congestion. Then these prices will need to be very high resolution price systems. And in the end, the distribution system operator, as we've defined it for years in European legislation, we need to become something like an orchestrator, where he does all his calculations about security and projects those, sort of serves it on a silver platter to the consumers, to the distributed generators as pricing. It's on an IT platform. That is a topic for private sector innovation, if there ever was one. And blockchain is just one key word that uh, might be a part of, of how this is really going to work. Um, the public sector has a, a role there too, um, because um, even if the startups will hopefully serve us the software, even if the distribution system operators today want to evolve in that direction perhaps and take their own investments, just like Enel has been taking all kinds of innovation investments, um, still there need to be regulatory changes, big time regulatory changes to allow that. And the public-private partnerships, the cooperation, the research prioritization we're doing in eTipsNet hopefully will lead to a situation where those regulatory needed changes will keep up and enable and support and push the private sector initiatives in this one out of 38 examples that we've seen. Because it's a whole one system, Europe-wide, from 400 volts to 400 kilovolts and beyond, and it needs to work together. So I'm looking forward, I hope you are too, to this thing next Monday. That's outdated. It will be next Friday. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Konstantin, with a, a plea for, for a, systems, uh, a systems approach. Um, moving swiftly on to our, our third, uh, third speaker, uh, Diego Pavia, from, uh, the CEO of Kik Inno Energy. Um, to, uh, to round up the, uh, the introductions uh, before, uh, before our debate. Diego, the floor is yours. You. I'll move away from the heat because it's like, uh, <laughs> take advantage of my long legs. So very short because it's late in the afternoon. A uh, couple of words of energy. Energy, I've got uh, 100 million euro a year annual investment muscle. We are around uh, here since 2011 and we have built an ecosystem that is geared towards impactful innovation. This is what we are. And I want to share with you today two things, the lessons learned over the last five years, six years, five years, six years, and second, a fact that maybe have been unnoticed by the innovation community. So the first uh, lessons learned is that uh, innovation as uh, an enabler 
of uh, energy transition, and I use the word innovation, not technology, because innovation is about technology, about uh, uh, social innovation, about business model innovation. It's, uh, it's pretty much six dimensions that we always have to tackle in order to understand whether we're going to be successful or not in, uh, <laughs> I close. whether we're going to be successful or not in helping the energy transition with uh, those three types of innovation. And you see six dimensions. I will cover only today one. This is a message I want to get across. And because technology, for us, we don't see a problem. Technology is always ahead of uh, what uh, we really expect to deliver. If you look at the set plan objectives that we had for LCU for PV, or LCU for onshore wind, offshore wind, uh, that were for 2020, we already covered them last year. So on the B2P side, that is on the upstream of the value chain, we see no problem whatsoever. Where we see something that is changing is on the downstream, on the business consumer, on the retails, escorts, the new entrants, immobility, and so forth. Again, as I said, upstream and grids, we don't see any big problem because it's going to be business-based evolutions and it'll happen. On the downstream, we see some, yeah, some things that we should be aware of. Also, one of the merits that we have is that we are technology agnostic. So in those uh, 300 partners and this 100 million euro investment a year, so we are investing in innovation in hydrogen, in several innovations, in nuclear also, because everybody is welcome to solve the problem. I don't think we should be maximalistic about anything. It's everybody has got his bits to contribute. That's the second lesson learned. And then the only message you want to get across is this. Is on this left part of the losange, the supply chain, who is going to pay for the party? Who is going to pay for the party of the market uptake of innovations in the energy transition? And uh, four facts. As you have read the winter package, the winter package plans or forecasts 177 billion euros a year, I repeat, 177 billion euros a year to make the energy transition that is uh, laid down in the winter package has to be mobilized. So who's going to pay for the party? These are those billions. So some facts. This is uh, the market capitalization of the big players, evolution of the last nine years. So the ones that were investing big time in the past to pull through uh, in research, then to innovation, then market uptake. They have their balance sheet pretty much constrained, their uh, credit rating pretty much uh, downgraded in several notches. So are they going to be the ones that are going to pay for the party? Then also we see on the second graph is how much the utilities, the main players, incumbents, were in terms of deals of billions of euros put on the table to make those market uptakes, and we see that their share is decreasing, and new investors come in. So the rules are changing. Just let's, to be aware, I don't bring any judgment, I'm just, it's factual. So the ones that are interested in bringing their money to make these energy transitions is different players. And normally they will have different metrics, different decision points, different ways of interacting with the value chain. Are they there forever, like they were duties in the past, or are they just opportunistic? So just a fact that is based on, on this. And the last point is, this is the asset portfolio of PGGM. PGGM, the biggest pension fund in Europe, Dutch. Well, the pension funds, the big investors of the last three years, they have written off $21 trillion, I repeat, $21 trillion of bad, what is called brown assets, energy assets. So the investments they had in energy assets, because they're going to be dispatched less hours, because of that, whatever it is, 21 trillion. It's staggering, the number. So those investors that were putting and chipping their money in, they're going to be double cautious now to invest again in new energy technologies, business models, social innovation, you name it. So that's a factor that we cannot overlook. The money that is being brought in into this energy transition is from different players, and many have burden figures. Still, the ambition is 177 billion euros for, as the winter package says. So let's have that in our minds when we forecast the speed of deployment. That was it. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Diego. 
Um, I'd like to give the opportunity to anyone who is in the room who has some questions about what we've seen. There is uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, information and some, some challenging assumptions. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, I already see in the back a question and one in the front. So please go ahead. Loud and clear. My reaction is that uh, in the past, uh, the transactions that were underpinning those billions were transactions B2B. Today, uh, in the future, the transactions are going to be on the B2C, and this is much less manageable. So you cannot just buy regulation and say, okay, now I'm going to shift from these three guys to those three guys. It's from these three guys to those millions of Europeans that are going to have to change behavior. And that's why in our favor six dimensions, that's key. That's the dimension that we have to be extremely careful of. The local, the local communities that the, with the package provides, the aggregators, it's an extremely good solution to make a separate step towards uh, the final citizen, consumer, user, whatever. But it's a journey. It's a journey. The rules are different. And that's why one of the biggest discussions in the winter package, or rather before it, was about capacity mechanisms. Because uh, the, the basic viewpoint that if the price signals are just right, and if they're high resolution enough locationally in the distribution grid, temporarily, uh, the preferences the con consumer really has um, about how much heating his house one degree more during the Dunkelflaute in, in Germany will be, will be worse and will be revealed. Will that truly drive investments? That's what many governments in the EU have, have serious doubts about. And that's why they say, well, let's define something that ensures we have enough generation capacity. Um, I, I think it is a journey. I'm personally optimistic we will get there. Um, but this will be a journey over, over 10 years for which we need lots of smart meters, lots of modeling, lots of experience, lots of innovation in the end with little companies trying it out and, and proving through the reaction of the customers uh, how this really works and how investments can be built on it. I very much hope we, we get there because that's the only way to make it consumer centric. Nicola? Uh, if I can add, I think the money is not really missing. There's a lot of money around. The question is about how I can take out the risk so that the money reaches this kind of industry. Uh, a lot changed. We have seen the pictures of one of the panels before that in five years solar panels went from being uh, the most expensive option to the cheapest option and everything changed. So demand changed, the customers are much more active, uh, transmission lines are much less used, uh, wind farms and solar farms connect to the distribution grid so you generate more near to your loads. And so it, the entire world changed in a very short amount of time. So it's very difficult to now attract a, a huge amount of investment if we use the same metrics we used to use like 20 years ago. Okay. So the question is really about how can we fix some variables on decarbonization, on the market design, etc., so that we'll bring down risk and then the money will flow. We are ready to use it, we are ready to deploy it. The question is how to do it efficiently. But it's really about risk in our point of view. I think I think we'll, we'll probably come back to that uh, briefly. But Mr. Khachimakakis had a, had a yeah, question. Thank you very much. One question to sector coupling, because Constantine mentioned sector coupling. Why do you think it's not in the winter package? It's not mentioned. Oh, it, it is. Yeah. Uh, it is not. Uh, but you can. And do you? Does it play a role in your scenarios as a cost? Uh, this coupling of sectors. Um, um, uh, power, heating, cooling, and mobility. Thank you very much. So the answer, the answer on my side, uh, then definitely uh, we have uh, in our uh, partnership, we have all, energy, all the energy carriers, we have incumbents and challengers, and uh, uh, we definitely look at not energy, but energy and industry altogether, and, er and energy and cities, and energy and citizen. So it's a combination. If you don't have a systemic approach, then there is not really the big gains and big gradients to, to, to obtain. Yeah. I think the, the sector coupling is not in the winter package and cannot be in detail there yet. That's why it's an, an R&D topic. 
uh, lots of things have, have to be figured out. I mean, do we, do we really know how customers will react uh, when there has been no wind and, and no sunshine for, for two weeks in all of Northern Europe? Um, there, there is research to be done, but it is very clear in the European Union that, that this is the way to go, that you don't decarbonize the economy if you don't decarbonize heating and, and also transport. And it is clear for the Commission and for ETIPSnet certainly uh, that if there's any anchor to that transition that, that roots this all in, in a market framework for driving the investments essentially from the customer side ultimately, then it's got to come from the electricity uh, grid and the electricity markets and, and how to couple those to the other markets that so far are totally decoupled from that as if it's a different world. Uh, that, that'll be the challenge and that's why we're prioritizing very highly the R&D that's needed for that. Any, any other questions in the meantime that came up? I mean, the one question, that, if there's one thing that I'd like to, to have answered for, for the audience, for the debate, uh, is basically the, the component about, okay, can we become a bit more specific uh, about what would be some of those things to help the market coupling, even if it's a first step or some of the things uh, that uh, the, the both of you were, were talking about in presentations. And who should do it? I mean, of course, in Brussels, we tend to, to look at uh, Mr. Turmes and his colleagues and people in the European Commission. Um, that may be one option, but there may be also others who need to kind of join the party. And I think it'd be interesting to hear from the panel, kind of give us an example, a concrete example that, that we can start, start working on uh, after the EU Sustainable Energy Week. So who would like to, to pick up the, bat the baton first? Maybe I can uh, start from the example I mentioned of the vehicle to grid. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the industry has a lot of responsibility in trying to find the boundaries. So we need to talk more between uh, the heating and cooling guy or the manufacturing part, the transport and electricity are doing that. And when you reach the boundaries, then you realize that you can convert uh, electricity into transport and then transport into heating, heat into electricity and the other way around. So instead of trying to solve a problem on a given space, or three problems in different spaces, you solve a common problem on a much larger space. You have a lot of more flexibility no, to, to pick up the solutions. Uh, there are regulatory barriers, of course. Uh, today, for example, a vehicle to grid, even if we are a, an Italian-Spanish company that's in many countries, we had to go to Denmark to do it. Mm. Uh, it was not that easy because it was not our home country, but it, it was one of the few countries where the regulation in place uh, that allowed us to sell from a car through aggregation uh, frequency services, primary reserves. Uh, this will be solved uh, in the energy package. I would say 90% of the barriers that we see on, uh, on the, I don't like the word coupling, I prefer the word integration. Before coupling to couple, it's, uh, it's useless. You, you try to integrate to, 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 to have uh, a more variability, more, not variability, more opportunity to solve the problems. Uh, so that would be my take on that. Thank you. Constantine, you wanna well, give it a go? Briefly deepening the example I was already giving, um, without the distribution system operators having that knowledge of their low voltage and medium voltage grids, which they don't have today, uh, this won't work. And without them deciding what sort of price signals they, they are willing to give to consumers, this also uh, won't work. So they got to do something, but the software development uh, is wide open, uh, in, in, in my observation, also to other players and, and to startups. Um, when it comes to the system working as a whole, mm -hmm. the regulatory decisions will be incredibly important. Uh, I agree that the win winter package goes very much in the right direction. Probably can't go into much more detail at, at this point right now, but the regulators in each country, they're, uh, they're going to have to be very flexible and, and on the ball to not, not block it, but rather support it. So are you saying that uh, the parliament and the council should not uh, change too much in it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I refrain from that. The direction on, on the pricing, uh, I thought, was, was pretty well done. Um, you don't want to force this sort of fluctuating price onto each and every household customer. But the idea to make sure that the possibility is there and that he can choose it if he so wants under the right condition, that I thought was a pretty good way. Okay. Diego. In our case, to share also failure. So we have tried in something that is collocated, that is the, the Rotterdam, the Le Havre, the Marseille of the world, where you have not only industrial side with uh, many sources and uh, demanders of energy, of all temperature energy or whatever, and then a city around. 
So we have tried a couple of times, and again, we have failed uh, to have this connectivity uh, coupling uh, uh, between within the industrial site uh, and uh, with uh, the cities around. Uh, because on paper, hey, it was a win-win-win for everybody, but we failed twice. And why? Because at the end, and I do expect that that is uh, oh, the t aggregators, uh, whatever. So there is an agent that should be the one uh, managing and doing the arbitrage and doing the investment then to recover. Uh, well, we failed twice, but there is absolutely an uh, easy win in many places in Europe. Yeah. And in terms of the, um, the energy package, I mean, the gentlemen to my right are, are quite happy with it. Um, when it comes to your, uh, your statement about pulling in the money, where, where does the, the money come from? Um, one of the aims of the energy package is to, to bring in that investment to, to give certainty. In your view, does it do that? Definitely. For us, the winter package is uh, only good news. All the thousand pages, each page is good news. I'm absolutely positive, as Constantine, that this will happen. Uh, but uh, as Nicola was saying, the rules are different. So we cannot think with a toolbox of the past in terms of financials. We have to think with a tool, new toolbox. And the pledges and the agents and their motivations are different. So you was, we have to be aware. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. I think I, I'll need to kind of slowly but surely wrap up because we still have an important item on our, our agenda um, uh, to really finish it off. Um, maybe just to, to wrap it up, one quick, uh, uh, quick fire on... Uh, what are the innovations or the technologies, in one or two words, that you see as most promising uh, going forward? And I'll, I'll start with Nicola. So in terms of innovation, I think that the business model uh, is going to, or the innovation business models is going to play a much larger role than the innovation of technologies. So we know what technologies we have around. We don't expect huge, uh, what had to happen really happened, and then we, we might have a few surprises, but it's, it's really about the business model. And the way to make it happen is really to, 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 to change the mindset. So you need to be ambitious. You need to be, realize that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Everything is changing. So you have many little pieces that you need to bring together. It's, it's a system that's much more connected. We all feel a little uncomfortable we are, because we are doing stuff that we are not used to do. So it's, it's a very exciting time yeah, to, to work in this sector. Good. And I will leave it to that. Thank you. I'd, I'd put it into the context of how optimistic or pessimistic we are in Europe. There was a time not so long ago when everybody was super pessimistic, including myself, given the Brexit. Uh, now we feel much more optimistic because of um, political reasons, but translated onto our topic, I would say, uh, we have so much to be proud of with the current electricity market that we've created for an entire continent of over 500 million people, where the wholesale market functions uh, without compare in the world. It's really, really nice. We always focus on the things to still improve. Mm. Sometimes we go too far, like the rock concept, for example, uh, regional operational centers goes too far for the TSOs, but it's a fantastic thing we already got. And uh, that's the big strength of Europe. We're working together in 28 countries, hopefully remaining that many, and we will, uh, you know, we're fighting in the different cultures and we come up with a system that, that works according to the rules of the European Union. We keep making it better, but that's an export thing by itself. To make this work with the technologies, with the digitization, uh, with the reliability, and with the market. Nobody else can do that. And, and that's an export thing for software companies, uh, for consultants, for, for all kinds of things, and of course for the manufacturers of electrical equipment, big time. Thank you. So it's keep, keep Europe uh, keep Europe great and be proud of and it. Be so. proud of what we got already and with each step we're taking. Good. And finally, Diego? From our side, uh, the, the key enabler, the game changer, is uh, in some of the function of the value chain is storage. A storage, uh, be it in uh, grid level, be it at the house level, be it uh, uh, in mobility. Uh, so, and again, all technologies are welcome. So power to gas, uh, batteries, um, uh, red flux uh, batteries. We need, and if we fix it right, uh, then the speed towards the goal, 2030, 2050, much short, can be shortened big time. Thank you very much. I think with that, I'll, I'll leave it. Uh, I think there's much more to discuss, probably not under the same hot lamps. Yeah. Um, but uh, thank you very much to, to our panel. Um, and um, uh, under a, a, hand of, uh, a round of applause, I will hand over to Raoni. Thank you.
So I'm back up here again to introduce MEP Claude Terms, who's our wrap-up keynote speaker tonight. Now, Claude Terms joined the European Parliament in 1999. That's a lot of years in the European Parliament. I was nine years old at the time. Like, I hadn't even graduated from primary school. He joined as a member of the Greens for Luxembourg and since became a leading specialist in energy policy, acting as a negotiator for the European Parliament on some key pieces of legislation. The second uh, energy package in 2001, the well-known 2008 Renewable Energy Directive. He recently published a book, 500 pages. I'll admit to have not read it, reading it all, but I did my best before we arrived tonight. <laughs> it covers 15 years of energy policy development in Brussels and in Europe, and We've also had some questions from the audience about your proposal to introduce a carbon price floor in the EU to replace the European ETS. So I hope you might speak to that as well. Thank you, Claude. Thank you so much. Time. So, I, I, sometimes I think in Platz they call me now a veteran uh, veteran MEP Claude Thomas, and then I, it's, I, I have the impression I, I'm some, somebody like from First World War. <laughs> uh, so it's a bit strange because I feel so young. I, I, I have still so many, uh, so much energy. Uh, good. Um, I think it's, I, it's a bit difficult for me to wrap up this because I was not here. That would be quite dangerous. But what I can do a bit is may, maybe give you a bit of uh, what I did in this book. Um, I, I often meet people who say to me, uh, with the energy union, we will create the European energy policy. I said to them, sorry, um, we have created that since more than a decade. So one of the reasons I, I, I did this book is that really to, it, it's an, I, I try to be educational, to show people, and I like very much your, 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 your basically your expression, we should be proud of what we have achieved. I was amazed myself how much we have achieved. So I, I had the pleasure to be uh, the rapporteur of the second electricity market directive. That was where we introduced regulators against the German government. It was a German red-green government. Uh, Clement was minister of economy. Uh, poor Trittin was like that. <laughs> uh, he, he was, uh, because it was the competence of, of Clement. So, Today, nobody, so all of you think that regulators have been there for always. No, we created them in 2003, uh, unbundling the grid from uh, the producers. That is also 2003, because uh, basically, how could you, could you imagine a car market in which Renault would own the highways <laughs> or Mercedes? So I, I think we, we had to... Uh, or, and then, of course, a, a lot of other things. The, the, and and uh, the market is, has really, really well developed. Um, the second thing uh, is which we created is, of course, these energy efficiency policies. And in order to understand, and I like very much uh, uh, Diego's slide on what has changed to the uh, value, valuation of the big power companies. And I think it's a combination of... of uh, so I think, see, and, and maybe uh, because we have somebody from Enel, and Enel is probably the one company which has best understood uh, that the world, the energy world is, is changing, or at least partially. Um, so what we have done is we have created a Europe in which oil consumption goes down for the first time since Second World War. Gas consumption goes down. And electricity consumption is flat, and even uh, in certain countries going down. Um, that is not, that is EU laws, eco design, above all eco design. 50% of all savings come from this eco design directive, labeling. And then uh, we created afterwards uh, the first building directives. And, and I, I'm, I'm probably one of the amendments I'm most proud of is near zero energy new buildings. My amendment, it was not foreseen at all in the Commission's version, uh, so all buildings in Europe have to be near zero energy in at latest 21. And that was, uh, that, that is probably the single game changer ever in European uh, basically building story because 
all the people around, architects, engineers, uh, the whole uh, uh, people who sell and buy, all of them, since that they know that uh, the, the, the building of the future is near zero energy, which means high efficiency plus renewables. And of course, that is easier to do on the new buildings, and now we will do it more and more on the existing building stock. So we have created a market, uh, and, and of course, CO2 and cars, and I, I cannot go to all. So we have created a market. Of, imagine you are in a market which is flat or going down, and then comes the Renewable Energy Directive, which is basically you have, uh, and I think it's, um, you, you are cooking in, in a, or you are, uh, I don't know, a, a small potato, or, no, 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 I have to, you are big potatoes in a, in a uh, so the Enel potatoes, the, the uh, ADF potatoes, the, and, and then you, you are in a, in, a, in a market which is flat, and then you have 20% new stuff coming in, which is the Renewable Energy Directive, which is going from 10 to 20 on all energy, but going from 15% to 35% in only 10 years on electricity. So you have a stable market, and then you throw 20% new in. And that has uh, exploded, literally, the market, and it has exploded companies. So E.ON is no more uh, E.ON. E.ON is new E.ON and the bad bank. And then you have RWE, which is a bad bank plus energy. Uh, and uh, good, and then you have companies, and, and maybe we can. It would be interesting to have you view who are in the. Then you have companies who have. Uh, so there was Enel Green Energy, which was outside the company, and then I think you brought it back because the only way. And wh why are Tyson uh, and Anterium and, and also Strachey? Why did they do that? Because the banks uh, and the rating agencies were downgrading, and do it was worse. RWE was worse than Greece. <laughs> so w without creating energy and giving visibility to financiers that the new company is about really having a chance to be in the new world, which is energy efficiency, renewables, and grids, uh, the banks would, would not have given again money. And it's, it's fantastic in a certain sense that energy was able, so RWE was almost no more able to get any money from the financing sector. And the day where they created energy, I think it was the single biggest, um, how do we call this, going to the IPO, uh, IPO uh, in recent years. So, so, uh, so the, it has completely changed. I was this week with uh, Cochere, who is the, the, the new leader of NG. And my book is very much about Mastralé, who is, was the old leader of NG. Uh, and, and I think she is miles away for, for Master A, so also going into the new world. She said to me that 50% of all energy will be decentralized. 50%, 5-0%, so good. Um, and why, why did that, uh, why, why, so there was of course an additional difficulty for all of us and especially for the power companies, that's the failure of EU ETS. And uh, good, and then I think it's really important to understand the failure of EU, EU ETS is the failure of policy making. Uh, and uh, in summer 2006, the Commission did its modeling in order to prepare the January 2007, which was the first proposal from Commission, then March 2007, first, uh, first uh, historic, and it was the first EU summit of Mrs. Merkel. That was when the 2020 20 was decided. And uh, so, but the Commission had done modeling which showed you do 20% efficiency in Europe and you do 20% renewable, you get an automatic 20% domestic CO2 reduction. So how it was, it cannot function if you have a domestic market going down 20% and then you suggest that in addition to efficiency and to renewable policies, there would be a market which would uh, be under pressure in a certain sense to deliver more, um, it cannot function. And the decision was even worse because then slipped in an amendment from Dirty Business Europe, which was opening it to international credits, which meant at the end of the day, we have decided 2020, 10. Domestic plus 10 from outside. So that, that a ton of carbon today in Europe is worth five euro. That's a miracle. It should be worse. So normally, if, if uh, 
So the value normally today should be zero, 0,1 euro per ton. The only reason why it's five is that the traders, like somebody who is lying on intense care, you, you, you go to church and, and you pray for him. So it is really, they, they, they hope that the market will, will recover. And the good news is that uh, there is two things which, which can happen uh, now in the next three months. One is that in the EU ETS there is a Czech amendment to, to do what I had proposed in the Energy Efficiency Directive of 2012, which is cancellation of the surplus. Because a market which has four billion surplus cannot function. Um, and that we can win. And if that cancellation is win, then something happens which which basically will, uh, maybe one day then Just Albeke will be a friend of mine, and uh, which he is not today because he has, as uh, the ETS gang leader, he was always against more efficiency and renewable policy because there was no instrument. The more efficiency and renewables we did, uh, the more uh, 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 wrong recalibrated ETS had to collapse. So, so, and now we are with the so-called Czech Amendment through the market stability reserve plus cancellation, we will be finally in a situation which is the best possible political world, which is if we can move faster on efficiency, let's do it. If we can move faster on renewables, let's do it. And we will be able to take out the excess capacity uh, to, to, not to, 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 to keep a price and even to keep out CO2. And that leads me to uh, to the issue of carbon floor. Um, be aware that there were days uh, some weeks ago where not a single kilowatt hour of uh, UK power sector came from coal. And that's the result of that the British, when it comes to, to climate policy, they got it right, they introduced the carbon floor price. And the good news, so, and uh, the Czech amendment taking out the emissions has one disadvantage, it will take uh, six, eight, ten years until that will really create scarcity enough to get the price up. And therefore, I think personally, and the good news is, I, I think I have spoken to Mr. Starace, to Mr. Tyson, to Mr. Uh, Mastio, to Mrs. Couchet, so all, to Vattenfall, Fortum, all power sector wants a carbon floor price. And um, we can get it uh, after the elections uh, in Germany. Uh, there's one nice story behind is that we could, there was talks between Hollande and Merkel and uh, Gabriel vetoed a year ago a carbon floor price in Germany because he had, it was the steel industry, that was the moment where, where they started their, their demonstrations. Now read the SPD program, read it. In the SPD program for the September election, the SPD is in favor of introducing carbon floor price. So which means, uh, so we have still FTP, which is a bit of a strange party, but Jorgo knows it better. Uh, so we, but I, I'm now, I'm getting really optimistic and if uh, Macron and, and Merkel have a deal, the beauty is all the others around don't even have the choice. <laughs> Why? Because France and Germany is so big that uh, if they introduce a carbon floor price, then immediately the, 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 the price on the wholesale market will go up. And then BASF in Netherlands will call the Dutch minister and saying, will I be compensated for the indirect uh, electricity cost raise? Because the Germans are compensating my factory in Germany and the French are compensating my factory uh, in France because they have a revenue with which they compensate me. And the Dutch minister, he will, in the first interview, he will say no. And in the third interview, he will say, uh, by the way, we have decided to join the German-French initiatives on the carbon floor price. And we will get a carbon floor price from Czech Republic, Scandinavia, all Central West. Italy wants it. Spain is, yeah, Mr. Nadal, we have to see his... Will depend a bit of his humor. I think Portugal will want it, and and then we have we are entering a, uh, a, a power sector which will have, uh, I think, a reliable, a more reliable signal where where the show goes. So that's a bit what uh, what I'm foreseeing. Uh, maybe a last word on on, uh, on 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 the sector coupling. I think in buildings it will happen, uh, but it will I think even more happen in in uh, in mobility. Dieselgate is one of 
the best lobby exercises ever in favor of electromobility. Uh, I think the, the, we, it's a good moment. The German car industry is, which is a giant. I can tell you, I have not met in all my life of policy making in Brussels any lobby which is comparable. The oil industry, tiny compared to car. Uh, the energy oligopolies, tiny compared to the cars. Can you imagine an industry where almost everybody has uh, really in a very, in, in, in a highly, in almost everything tricked over 10 years? And now we have enquete commissions. They are still able to more or less escape from policy making, uh, just going against them. But the good news is we have laws in Europe and we have uh, courts in Europe. So now, uh, see, all of them are almost in court. And the, I think the judges will not be impressed as much by the leaders from the car industry as, as the policymakers. And therefore, uh, I think what will happen now is moving over to electromobility. And if we do not uh, get, uh, and I think Europe needs now an electromobility quota because the Chinese have already one. And then comes, of course, maybe one dimension which we will not be able to go deeper, which is what is missing still is the industrial policy dimension of our energy transition. And uh, I, I'm now trying, I, every day when I meet the commissioner, I say to them, what are we doing on batteries? What are we doing on batteries? What are we doing on batteries? What are we doing to relocate PV uh, cell production in Europe and so on and so on? And don't estimate the Chinese. Read the China 21 program, then you know exactly what they have in mind. They don't hide it. But I think, and that's maybe my final that with Macron, uh, Next to it, I said Macron is sitting. Maybe if I would go here, it could, could be that the door is, uh, we can go over to the council. Uh, Macron has opened uh, the game on that Europe needs uh, also trade defense instruments. And I think we will need trade defense instruments also in energy. China will be our partner in the new geo energy geopolitics, which is technology wins over resources, so it's China, India, Europe winning over Saudi, Russia, Trump. Uh, that's for, but China will also uh, be a damned, well-organized, potent uh, technology racer. And, and we need, I think, to really get our acts together. Good. I think I stopped there because I was probably already too long. And maybe uh, if we can take some questions, if it is not... Or are we immediately going to champagne? What is? Uh... We, we are certainly going to get there eventually. Does anyone have some questions for Claude? There's a microphone in the back here with Alexis. Uh, it's, a, it's tough, Claude. You know, there have been back to back. This is the core of the uh, of the energy transition yeah, yeah, yeah. community, <laughs> and they've, yeah, yeah. No, they've they, born with no, us they, for the past hours. And yeah, yeah, they, yeah no, I, certain of them. I saw them on on on, on Monday afternoon. No? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's been a it's been a non non yeah. stop cycle. And I was probably not provo okay. provocative enough uh, this evening. Yeah. But my book is, uh, I think, quite outspoken. Uh, I had a bit of a uh, logistical uh, disaster. It was to arrive on Monday. Uh, we had problem with the editors to ship it in. But you can already buy it uh, on on Amazon or through my website. And um, is it nice reading? Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, so, so when can we expect the English version? No, no, September? it's there. No, no, no. The English version is there. You can. Uh, the French version is public since three months. Yeah. That was when we. Yeah. No, the the English version is in the electron. So you can buy it uh, through Amazon. Uh, but uh, I couldn't bring hard copies. But there will be hard copies uh, hopefully from next week on. Great. We expect a free copy for everybody that stayed. Yeah, yeah. So that was exactly my, my idea, I, to, to bring the free copies for rewarding, uh, really, your interest uh, in, in uh, European energy policy. I think we, it, it's, it's great that you, you help us not only to be interested, but a lot of you are fantastic actors. It's basically you are our ambassadors. Uh, to make this happen. It's called the energy transformation, an opportunity for Europe. Yes. Correct? Like and I stress and I stress opportunity for Europe because uh, I think uh, it's a real opportunity for Europe. We have a question from our colleague Dietrich here. Yes. J just, a, just a brief one. I don't think we can can let you escape without, without a question. Um, more on an anecdotal 
uh, given your long history in, in the European Parliament and the energy world here, two questions. What's the voice that you feel is still missing uh, from the people that come knocking on your door? And second, what's the, the best or the most original lobby activity you've seen? You've mentioned the, germ the, the car industry, but maybe to close it off, kind of what was something that you thought like, that was that was quite quite interesting. Uh, I hadn't expected that. Ooh, difficult. I think the voice which is now missing is that those power companies which have decided to move into the new world, uh, they have one, I would say, one sin to clean up, especially also those who have been in the Margaret Group. So Mestralé and and all the gang in the Margaret group. It's Margaret group because they met in this surrealistic painter's Margaret uh, museum. So they went, and I can tell you, and, and that's one of, maybe one of the really unacted. Master Lo, I, I, I had very good contacts to the Van Rompuy cabinet, and I was trying to influence through my way the uh, council conclusions of October 2014. Each time when I met, the people around von Rompuy, they said, Claude, you come too late. We had another prime minister who was brainwashed by Mr. Westerle. So Westerle took, when he went to Spain, he didn't go alone to Spain. He took, of course, the Spanish companies to see Rajoy. And then he took the Italian companies to go to the Italian prime minister, and so on and so on. So we were, it, it is not surprising that we got to this very bad decision. And there was one meeting with Barroso in November 2014, no, 2013, uh, where Barroso, I got after that meeting, one to one, Barroso with somebody from the Margaret Group. The so next week, my, my phone uh, rang, and then people in commission said to me, Claude, we lost national binding targets. We are no more on, on speaking about 35, we are speaking about 27. So uh, that was, if somebody has to get the lobby award in the energy sector, I think it's Westralé. Um, and then, um, who, yeah, so and, and now the, I think the, I want the progressive power companies uh, to now uh, help us to create more visibility. With Ms. Ms. Uh, Madame Cochet, on, on when I met her on Wednesday, I said to look, she, she complained, she said, we have a very good visibility in the long term now. Everybody knows get to zero, but we have a lot of fog for the next five or eight or 10 years. And this fog is the fog which has been produced by the Margaret Group. So you guys, you now try to bring the sun in with a good declaration after summer that you want higher renewable shares. So I think that will help you and it will help us. It will ha help citizens to be more optimistic about Europe and it will help us above all to get less the heat uh, from, uh, from the climate. That is, uh, and what the, the, the thing which I could not do in the book, of course, because I'm, I'm not retired yet, but the thing which I could not do was, of course, to, to, ta to, to, to give you a details about the anecdotes uh, in the parliament. And one of my nicest, uh, which I can give you just a teaser, when we had the EED directive, people from people and Royal from, from, from the conservatives, they had done body count and they uh, came to the conclusion that with Goebbels, who was this guy from Luxembourg in the Socialist, plus Gehrig and plus others, they would have a majority against me, a tiny one. But so uh, I had organized 11 rounds of negotiations and basically during uh, 10 rounds, nothing had happened because uh, they, they really hoped to, to get a majority. But and what they hadn't understood is that the former assistant of a man who has climbed the mountains uh, so Messner from South Italy, his assistant became assistant from somebody from Lega Nord. <laughs> and when we dis, dis, when EED was done, we scouted this, and then we got this deputy with this assistant to be the one for Lega Nord, and uh, uh, the professor, the, no, Dottore uh, from uh, Lega Nord, he was. He was a mayor from Northern Italy who had done 
biomass in his city, who had done uh, refurbishment of, of his houses. And so uh, Lega Nord was, of course, in the body count of people and Royal. And then it, we had fantastic meetings. Uh, they, they really tried in the, in the shadow mixings to win. And then uh, it, it, was, it was a pet situation. And then all eyes went to, do, to the Dottore. And then the Dottore, he said, I'm with Turmes. Good, and then that compromise was won again. So we won it, it was really tiny. I tell you, it was really tiny. But that's the beautiful stories which I can't yet write because I want to stay in the eye of the storm and the eye of the storm is in the European Parliament. Okay, every day is a battle, right? Here's a question from our colleague Thomas. Claude, I think you wrote a great book, but I, would, I look forward even more to reading your memoirs then when they have been, <laughs> when they have been written. Um, I, I think you did very well on this zero and near zero energy um, amendment and which came in the end legislation. But you said also we are doing now something more on the renovation sector. What are we doing really? Because if I look at the current proposals, there is not a lot of it in that would, would make me believe that the renovation sector will be tackled. At the same time, it's probably the most important piece of sectoral uh, approach that we need. So, so what can we expect? Yeah, so in, the, in 2010, there was no money on the table because Barroso had decided in the recovery package after Lehman Brothers to give money to carbon sequestration. I, I had said to commission, look, I promise you, you will create 50 consultancy jobs, but that's all. Uh, for one and a half billion, uh, give me money for energy efficiency. But Barroso did the wrong choice. Therefore, when we negotiated in 2010 the building directive, it was pretty clear all Central and Eastern Europe was against anything tough on, on renovation. And therefore, the only thing which we could win was on new buildings. Then when we did in 2012 the EED, we did something which normally we are not allowed to do, but we did nevertheless. We created a fully fledged article which has everything to do with the building directive, but was not really the place in the energy efficiency directive, which is the article, uh, I think, four or five, which is the long-term building roadmaps, where we forced every government to do, to analyze its building stock. You have buildings from when? Before the 50s, after the 50s, high rise, low rise, with owners, without owners, because as long as you don't, do not need, uh, know that, you cannot have targeted policy. So this article is the most important article. Now we transfer it over to the building directive and we will bring it with Ben Benson and some muscles. Our difficulty is, and, and uh, I, have, I, 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 I went to the Juncker people relatively early when they drafted the energy union and I tested with them the idea, uh, Brussels will say every F and uh, E building in Europe is forbidden to be sold or rented uh, if it is not upgraded before, which is a decision, which is a national measure you have in Netherlands for commercial buildings, and which was a measure which at that time was discussed in France. Um, but uh, uh, Juncker also, because he was afraid to get uh, too much heat and, and populism against Brussels, they decided at the highest level not to do any uh, tough constraint on renovation. Uh, so, which means we are stuck with the roadmap, we will muscle it, but uh, the other things and what we did together with commission is smart financing for smart buildings. And that is also the reason I lost the battle against Barroso. Then I lost my first battle in the parliament when the FC was done because I had a majority in parliament for 50 billion ring fans for energy efficiency. And then that was lost during the negotiations. Uh, also because EIB was against, you can imagine, uh, uh, they interfering with our votes. And, but I lost the third battle uh, because now the Commission has understood energy efficiency, massive money for energy efficiency creates jobs in Europe. So the situation is getting better. There's one problem to be solved, and I think that's more a problem for Diego uh, than for anything else, which is I think the business model for renovation is not a good one. Uh, and it's not a good one because people, we do not have one-stop shops. I do not want to go to live with my mother-in-law, even if she's charming, for one and a half or two years. And, and in my free time, after having worked, uh, I don't know how many hours a day, to coordinate uh, 15 different, not very well qualified craftsmen. That's the reality of renovation today, and that cannot function. Therefore, I, I have asked, so what we will add to the long-term building roadmaps is an obligation for every member state 
to have a national building platform in which they have to discuss how to improve uh, their renovation. And I think we need, uh, and I want every year or every two years, a report from that table, round table to the national parliament so that we have democracy about this. And then I think in the next, with Potocznik, the, the research commissioner, and then environmental commissioner, I, I, I was very close to him. But I, I lost the battle in FP7. I had said to him, look, we need massive money for building renovation. Uh, a bit for new materials, but even more for new business models. And the DG research people uh, vetoed that uh, the idea which I had given to Potocznik. So we have lost seven or eight or 10 years uh, that DG research didn't spot that uh, building and building renovation, the business model around the logistics around it, uh, that that is one of our biggest weaknesses in the energy transition. So we have lost 10 years just because we had some people which were, which basically didn't, didn't spot this, uh, this issue. Good, and then of course it's the issue of we will have uh, an, better energy efficiency hopefully, and we have here a real expert sitting with us uh, and, and to, who could be, be valorized a bit more, to say, be said uh, mildly. Um, but then it comes also the question, what is the remaining heat or cooling? And, and on that, I think there is the issue of, uh, I think heat pumps will play a bigger role. Uh, I still think that heat pumps need a, very, a much higher seasonal performance factor. And I think that heat pump industry should do something to bring new additional renewables to the electricity uh, which they provide, and, and we will have to, I think that will be the price which, uh, if you will have a bigger market, but I think it should be a qualified bigger market, and not cheap heat pumps from I don't know where, which, which will not be, which will prolong the coal power plants and not uh, help us to, to do the transition. And the other issue, and that's also something for innovation, I'm getting more and more the messages from experts that we need heat uh, heat systems or uh, central district heating systems uh, of a completely new uh, quality because they will be, it will be not so very big tubes with very big uh, temperatures, but it will be low temperature, but still we need them. Uh, and then they have, of course, to be built on, on geothermal, on solar thermal. Uh, and, and, and so, th and that's something, we, unfortunately, and I don't know if somebody from the cogeneration industry is here, cogeneration industry is a bit like the car industry, but without the muscles. So it's a, a relatively weak lobby, which, but who has stayed too long in the old world, uh, continuing to think that you can have a business perspective on coal or gas-based central district heating system. I think then you should not be surprised that nobody at commission and nobody in parliament is listening to you anymore. So we need now uh, to get the incentives uh, also to change the heating, central district heating systems completely over to renewables. And the heating obligation which is in the renewable directive is a way to do it. So I will come forward with a more detailed and a more sophisticated proposal next week in my amendments around the heating obligation. Is champagne ready or what? Thanks very much, Claude. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the moderators. Thank you to the Revolve team. Thank you all for coming. We have some bubbles out there in the reception. Hopefully it'll be fresher with the fountain. Thank you.